Thank you, Dean. I'm glad to be here tonight, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, David and Dean, for participating in this. I'm really looking forward to this. You don't get conservative Orthodox Presbyterian churches and secular humanist organizations cooperating very often on putting together an event. So I think this is pretty exciting with regard to that, to allow these views to be heard. They don't often get heard by the other side. I want to start out, because I've only got 20 minutes to get right into the meat of things. The debate is whether God is necessary for ethics. To start out, I want to define what I mean by God, basically. By God, I'm referring to basically a classic Christian definition of God, an infinite personal being who is at the back of all things, who is the creator of all things, the ground of all things, the source of all reality, the context of all reality. I think that it's, in my view, the classical Christian view of God that can provide a basis for ethics. And so this is the view of God that I will be defending. In terms of the difference between a universe with God and a universe without God, the main difference for our purposes is that in a theistic universe or a universe with God, you have an absolute person who is at the back of all things, who is the source of all reality, a personal being with mind and will, who knows, who can have desires and love and hate and things of that sort, as opposed to on the non-theistic universe, a universe without God, the origin of all things comes from something impersonal, matter, energy, the laws of physics, whatever it may be, different forms in which this takes, yet the principle is that it's something impersonal, something that's not a person. In other words, God doesn't exist. And this is the difference that will be important for this discussion. I want to show, I want to make two main points. I want to argue that ethical obligation cannot exist without the existence of God. And I want to argue that without the existence of God, we do not have sufficient motivation for ethical living. So to start out, let me define ethical obligation. By ethical obligation, I'm referring to a very common sense notion. When you say, I ought to be honest and respectful to people, for example. This is my responsibility, my moral responsibility. I should be honest. I'm supposed to be honest. We say it in many different ways. You can distinguish obligation from motivation and from mere statements of fact. So, for example, to put them all together in one sentence, you could say, well, I ought to be nice to my sister, but I'm not particularly motivated to be nice to my sister, and I don't want to, and so I won't. So there you see the statement of obligation, motivation, and fact. I may not actually be nice to my sister. I may not want to be nice to my sister, but I ought to be nice to my sister. So you see the concept there. You can distinguish obligation from simply motivation. Saying I ought to do something is different from saying I want to do it or I like doing it or do I have a taste for it or something like that. It's an entirely different concept from either of those things. So my argument is that you cannot have statements of ought or should in that sense. You cannot have ethical obligations without the existence of God. And here's the reason. It's actually very simple. Oughts, obligations, shoulds, moral responsibility imply an ideal for human behavior, for the way things should be. An ideal, a preference. To say I ought to be honest and respectful is to say that somehow it's preferable, it's better. It fits some kind of ideal standard that I should be honest and respectful rather than otherwise. But if we start talking about ideals, we're talking about a standard for what things should be, for a goal for how things, for how I should behave, where does this ideal come from? An ideal is a goal. It's a desire. It's a preference for how things should be. But preferences and ideals and goals are not things that non-personal objects have. Rocks, for example, do not have ideals. They do not have goals or purposes. They don't have any kind of standards for how they would prefer things to be. Only persons have these sorts of things. And yet, so we have this conundrum. We have something called ethical obligation that's not reducible to my own taste and yet which exists in the universe but which must be rooted in a person. A person must have these ideals and preferences for it to make sense. And yet it's not my preferences. It's not when I say I ought to be nice, I'm not saying, well, I really like being good. I like being friendly. I like helping people. I don't like suffering and things like that. We're saying I ought to avoid these things. I ought to avoid murder. I ought not to treat people disrespectfully and so on. Well, maybe it's your taste. Maybe when I say, well, I ought to be honest and respectful, I'm saying, well, you want me to be nice and respectful and honest and respectful. Well, no, obviously that's not the case. 
whatever, what, if you want me to do something, it doesn't obligate me any more than if I want you to do something, it obligates you. If I, if I like spaghetti, it doesn't mean you have to like spaghetti too, you know, for example. There's no ethical obligation flowing out of a simple desire that I have. And it, and it works uh, either way. And it doesn't matter how many people you add to the process either. If 10 people uh, say that I, uh, you know, say that they would really like it if I was honest and respectful, this doesn't obligate me to be honest and respectful. If, if the, the whole world had a genetic proclivity to somehow, for some reason, like donuts, this would not say I have an ethical obligation you know, to like donuts. You see a distinction between these two things. People cannot obligate people, ultimately. We can express our motivations, we can express our desires for what we want to see happen, but I'm not bound by your desires and neither are you by mine. And that's true for the whole human race. If you're going, we're going to have an ideal that binds us, what we're implying is that the person whose ideal, whose preferences, whose purposes it is, is some, something different than just your average human being wandering around on earth. We're talking about a person who has the authority over me, who is able to define what I ought to do, who is able to bind me in an absolute sense, who is able to say, who's able to say that, that my, my very purpose of my existence is bound up with this person. We need a person who is able to say, I own you, and your purpose of your existence depends on what I want you to be and to do. Such a person would have to be the very foundation of my existence and of the existence of all reality. Would have to be a person who is not just one other entity wandering about the universe, but someone who created the universe, who is the source of the universe, who is the ground and context of all reality. And such a person, obviously, would be my definition of God. We need God to have real ethical obligations. You can, look the same, you can see the same thing from the perspective of, of intrinsic value or human rights. We say people have value and therefore ought to be treated respectfully. What does it mean? We say human beings have value. Are we simply saying, I like people? You like people? A whole bunch of people like people? No, we're saying something much bigger than that. We're saying... I ought to value and respect people. There's some kind of ideal standard again going on here. It's, we're bringing those oughts again. Well, who's, to say someone has value is to say they're important. Important to who? Again, only important to God makes sense as a definition of that, as an explanation. Human rights. If, if I say I have a right to life, that means, basically, you ought not to kill me. There we go. There's our oughts again. In other words, if you don't have oughts, you don't have rights. If you don't have God, you don't have rights. There's no moral responsibility, there's no ethical obligation, nothing I'm supposed to do, nothing I'm responsible to do, nothing I'm ethically obligated to do unless God exists. Now the non-theist position, the universe without God, is going to try to account for ethics in other ways. Sometimes they will try to come up with other ways of grounding ethical obligation. For example, well, we, the reason why we don't like to hurt people is because you know, evolutionarily, we, we evolved a, a sense, you know, our ancestors, when they hurt people, they got wiped out. So, so now we have an evolved conscience that gives us, makes us feel bad when we hurt people. But this doesn't, doesn't ground obligation. Again, we're mixing up fact with obligation here. The fact that, that people happen not, for some, whatever reason, whatever evolutionary reason, not to like it when people suffer doesn't tell me what I should do. We have a gap between the is and the ought there that can't be bridged by that kind of argument. So what, you're, what you end up with in a universe without God is basically what the, the humanist uh, statement that Dean read earlier said. You have human needs and desires, and you have the consequences of actions in this life in a universe that was created without purpose, without design, and has no ultimate justice in it. And, and the non-theist position is going to have to derive ethics from that source. That's all that there is. But remember, there's no ethical obligation, only human needs and desires that that's going to be able to be derived from in that context. So that leads me to my second point, my, main, my second main argument, which is that even beyond the question of ethical obligation, we have to get to the question of motivation. And I would argue that a universe without God does not provide adequate motivation for behaving in an ethical way. For, live, for respecting people at all times, for being honest and not cheating and living basically what would be considered a sufficiently ethical life by just even just common, uh, common understanding that we would all probably share. 
Now, I'm not saying that therefore every non-theist will run off and do anything, you know, just whatever whim comes to mind. I don't think that's the case. There is some motivation in a non-theistic universe, if you, if you grant that there can be a universe that, without God, which I don't, but for the sake of the uh, debate, I'll, I'll grant the existence of people and things like that to, uh, to the non-theist position. Um, but what you're going to have is you're going to have these human needs and desires. What, what kind of desires do we have? Well, we have, we have self-interest. We have psychological needs for social relationships. We have, uh, we have uh, the need to uh, conform to the laws of physics. If you jump off a cliff, you're going to die. That's very likely, assuming the cliff's high enough and, and other factors don't intervene. Uh, so we have to conform to those, even in a non-theistic universe. If you go around being rude and disrespectful to everybody around you, you probably won't have very many friends. That's what I mean. These are the kind of consequences that exist. Well, since we have a need for friendship, we have a need for not hurting ourselves by jumping off cliffs, we're therefore probably not going to do it. We're going to, you know, we're, we're probably generally going to, to live respectful kinds of lives overall. However, this is not universal. I grant there's, there's some motivation for behaving ethically, but not sufficient. I think the non-theist position has a very narrow viewpoint of human psychology. The assumption basically is that, that the universe is such that any intelligent person, basically, with basic normal human needs and desires, is going to want to live an ethical life in, in basically every significant respect. But I don't think that's the case at all. Human, human beings can be motivated by all kinds of different uh, motives. The whole human race is not seeking how to avoid risk and danger and to live the most contented, peaceful, quiet life possible. I mean, look at skydivers, for example. Or the crocodile hunter. Remember him? Died a few months ago. I don't think uh, people who do skydiving or the crocodile hunter probably were out for safety as their main goal. I, I don't think it was because they just didn't understand the risks either. I don't think you went up to, uh, the, to uh, Steve Irwin and said, gosh, did you know that um, crocodiles are dangerous? And jumping on them is probably not har not, it's probably, you know, it could be harmful to your health. He's like, oh my goodness. I should go and become an insurance salesman or something like that. Uh, of course he's not going to say that. He's aware of that fact. What it, I, I'm not going to ask you, but, but uh, I'll sort of rhetorically ask. Why do you think he wants to he want to do that? The thrills. It's a thrilling life. It's probably more exciting to be an insurance salesman. Sorry to any insurance salesman out there, but you, you, get, you get the idea anyway. Um, now... You could say, was his life less rational than the life of somebody who tries to stay away from danger and never get into trouble? It's difficult to say that. People have different preferences. He likes his life better that way. Other people like comfort and peace. I'm not going to jump on crocodiles anytime soon. I, I don't care for that sort of thing. And even if I was a non-theist, I wouldn't be jumping on crocodiles. Now, let's put that in a moral sphere. You think it might be possibly thrilling to some people to rob a bank? Or to commit some kind of a crime? to be on run from the police, to join a gang, to be a part of some kind of you know, underground drug movement of some sort? Do you think this, this possibly provides some thrills? Do you think all these people just, oh gosh, I didn't know that the police might be after me. I might be arrested. They know that. The risk is more fun. They want to live this kind of life. So remember, in a non-theist view, you cannot look at those people and say, well, you ought not to live this way. You have an ethical obligation, a moral responsibility to live an ethical life. You don't have that option in a non-theist view. All you can say is, gosh, you really don't want to do that. You, you, really, you really don't. If you were just a little more intelligent, you'd see you really don't want to live that way. But I think that's extremely shallow, and I think you see my point. Um, it's very narrow psychologically. And we don't have to go to those extremes. I mean, just look at everyday life. Uh, how many opportunities do we have in our daily lives to cut corners ethically, to tell a lie, to cheat, to get away with something, to snub somebody, to be rude to somebody, to not relieve suffering on a daily basis? Uh, you know, the, the non-theist can say, well, you'd feel bad about yourself if you do that. Really? All the time. There's that narrow psychological thinking again. You can rationalize. You have ways out. You can forget about it. You can get over it. I mean, after all, nobody has any intrinsic values, so you don't, there's no reason why you should care, so why feel guilty? If you can get away with it and be happy, live a contented life, absolutely no reason whatsoever why you shouldn't do it. So we, we have an inability in the non-theist universe to, to ground a concept of ethical obligation, to say, I ought to do something. I am, I am 
duty bound to fulfill the desires of some being who's the, who's the source of my being and who owns me. And there's not sufficient motivation to get us even everyday lives to live sufficiently ethically and to say why somebody who lives a thrilling life of crime, even to the point of a serial killer or something like that, to use an example that I, I know is sort of extreme, but you get the point. To even say that life is, is worse, you can't say that. Can you say it's even less, uh, less motivation to live it? Can you say it's irrational, that you wouldn't really want to do it? I think that's a narrow, narrow psychologically. So some might respond to this and say simply, well, you can't, uh, maybe there is no ethical obligation, so maybe, maybe we don't need God because we don't need ethical obligation at all. And maybe we don't need ethical motivation. Well, that's a possible uh, direction someone could take, but I think we know better. You can say that, you can deny it theoretically, but we all know that we are, that there are things we ought to be, there are things we ought to do, and there are things we ought not to be and do. We know that deep down, we can't erase it. We know that that's not true, and therefore, we do know that we belong to God, that God exists, and that, that God's values are behind us, that, and, and God owns us and has the right to tell us what to do, because that's the same thing. It's the same claim in the end. So, that's basically my position. You cannot ground ethical obligation, nor can you ground a sufficient motivation for ethical living uh, without uh, the existence of God. Thank you, Mark. In fact, you took less time than you could have and perhaps should have. But again, God being on your side, what do you care, you know? Uh, so, uh, I forgot to mention one thing, which is that uh, humanists of Utah, they do have their literature and their table over there as well. I forgot to mention that. Anyway, I would like to invite David Keller now to give the other side. David. While well, Mark's argument was very compelling, I am unconvinced. The, God, the question that we're uh, considering tonight, is God necessary for ethics? My answer is unequivocally no. There is no necessary con uh, connection between theism and ethics. This answer is demonstrated by the fact that there are unethical theists History is replete with examples of theists murdering in the name of God, even here in Utah, and ethical atheists. We all have one, at least one as a family member or friend. Logically, one single instance of an ethical atheist blows apart any purported connection between God and ethics. I believe in truth there are millions or even billions of counterexamples. The only way for the theological ethicist to feign an affirmative answer at this, um, at this point would be to claim that ethical atheists are really closet theists. <laughs> but the hubris of claiming to know the inner life of others is something that even the most judgmental theistic moral philosopher is certainly eager to avoid. Therefore, there is no necessary connection between God and ethics. Well, rather than uh, dispatch the question of the debate uh, one minute into it, let's. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to take the opportunity to investigate uh, some other nagging nuisances of theistic ethics. Let's uh, consider some anthropological inconveniences. If there was a strong connection between religion and ethics, then one would assume that persons would actively choose the correct religion as the model of their lives. But choice of religion seems to be based on place, not epistemology. 
a majority of religious persons adopt the religion of their community. That is why Bangkok is predominantly a Buddhist city, why Copenhagen is predominantly a Protestant city, why Rihad is predominantly a Muslim city, and why Salt Lake is predominantly a Mormon city. Choice of religion is anthropological, not epistemological. Further, basing religion leads to relativism. But wait! Relativism is exactly what acolytes of theistic ethics claim to avoid. Against humanism, theistic ethicists claim that religious morality is supposed to elevate us above the tribalism of earthly existence to a more enlightened, universalistic respect for all beings worthy of moral considerability. This guarantee is patently false. The greatest sales pitch for institutionalized religion is that one particular denomination, this one, will provide you with a more direct avenue to the truth than other denominations, because this one is favored by God. To this end, religious ethics has exacerbated tribalism rather than assuaged it. In large part, the history of human civilization is the story of warring groups clashing on account of the exclusivity promoted by religion. Ethics based on religion begets violence. With the words, God wills it, Pope Urbane II launched the First Crusade. With those words, tens of thousands of people died. Theistic ethics suffers not only from problems of inter-religious relativism, but also intra-religious relativism. My opponent in this debate has claimed that theological ethics provides an objective criterion for morality based on divine intentionality. Therefore, logically speaking, if two people hold mutually exclusive views on morally correct conduct, both cannot be correct. One view is mistaken. So the question becomes, what is God's will? Unfortunately, religious dogma does not help much in providing moral guidance. Let's say that a Protestant fundamentalist teenager is wondering whether he should enroll in the nearby state college to get a secular education after graduation from a private Bible study high school. He may recall the divine advice of Proverbs. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget nor turn away from the word of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever else you get, get insight. Prize her highly. But then the teenager remembers the warning of the very next book of the Hebrew Bible, quote, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and those who increase knowledge increase sorrow. And God's admonition in the New Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. The decision to pursue higher education is perhaps one of the most important decisions in a teenager's life 
And for an evangelical Christian, it is likely a moral decision, albeit one in which the Word of God, as transmitted through the Bible, does not offer much practical guidance. One possible solution to this quandary for the theological ethicist would be to consult religious leaders. But during the debate on whether, uh, whether to abolish slavery here in the United States, Christian leaders notoriously use scripture and divine intentionality both as a justification for the uh, propagation of slavery and its abolition. Again, religion provides no concrete guidance on critical moral issues confronting the human condition. So, to base something as important as standards of moral conduct on something so vague, so ambiguous, so diaphanous, so ephemeral as ecclesiastical dogma is as misguided as it is dangerous. What's the solution? A, a solution to the insurmountable incoherence of theistic ethics is to give up supernaturalism and ground ethics in the natural world. This ground, this source, is right here in our own heads, namely reason. On the humanistic account, cognition, the result of evolutionary process, that is, biological evolution through natural selection, enables self-awareness. Self-awareness allows us to at once see ourselves both as subjects in the world as well as objects. This is reflected in our use of language, the first person, the second person, the third person. The ability to see ourselves as an object amongst other objects which are also subjects, lays the groundwork for ethics. Rationality, rationality discloses beings, that is, centers of value, worthy of moral considerability. This, as Mark has correctly pointed out, is a naturalistic, biological foundation. An entity can be harmed or benefited depending upon what kind of entity it is. Human being, cougar, goat, or oak. Entities with intrinsic value do not necessarily need to be aware of that value. In other words, there is a difference between being a moral agent and possessing moral considerability. Some beings are worthy of moral considerability, but are not moral agents. Human beings happen to be both. <clears throat> Turning to the question of moral obligation, which Mark nicely brought up in his opening remarks, moral awareness prescribes moral obligation, that is, an awareness that you are connected to other beings in a webwork of relationships, social and ecological, and, that, and the fact that your actions voluntarily and involuntarily affect those other beings worthy of moral considerability. Recognition of these myriad relationships usually involves psychological processes which we would not normally call rational, spiritual, emotional, intuitive, 
and so forth, but the organization of the specifics of these relationships within which, uh, excuse me, the organization, uh, the organization of the specifics of these relationships into a coherent worldview within which our moral lives are led involves, without exception, rationality. If you have a moral awareness of your place in the world and the fact that other subjects are also objects and can be affected by your actions mandates moral obligation or moral duty. This crucial point repudiates the theistic ethicist's central claim that secular ethics can only ground egoism and nothing more. Rather, on my argument, rationality mandates extra egoistic obligation to others. In conclusion, <laughs> fortunately for ethics, it makes no difference what God wills. Thankfully, we have something much more concrete to base ethics on, in a word, reason. Theistic ethics does have some value, but this value is utilitarian. For persons unable to follow the dictates of reason, the external motivation of divine reward or retribution provides a restraint for actions which threaten the common good. Belief in God functions as a giant panopticon. This last point suggests another. If two persons act in exactly the same way, fighting injustice or engaging in humanitarian aid, for example, the secular humanist is more praiseworthy than the theist because the humanist acts for the inherent value of morality itself while the theist acts for the instrumental value of obedience to God. Therefore, if God exists, God gave us reason for a reason, to enable us to mature beyond moral adolescence, to become autonomous moral agents in no need of divine guidance. If God does not exist, it makes no difference for ethics. Reason prescribes we recognize the intrinsic value of all other beings besides ourselves who are worthy of moral considerability and then acting as to affirm their natural purpose. Either way, God is unnecessary for ethics. Uh, let me just kind of address point by point, I think, here. Um, unethical theists and ethical atheists. Um, on some degree, of course, I would acknowledge that that's, that's true. Um, there are there are certainly nice atheists. There are friendly atheists. There, you know, there are lots of atheists who, you know, are basically civil people. Um, I would agree with David, however, that that there that atheists are being good for the wrong reason, and therefore don't have. It really is a. It's not an ethical motivation in the end, similar to what he said about uh, the theist. But yes, I will acknowledge that outward behavior, certainly of many atheists, is very laudable in a civil sense and good. And I think, and, and that's, that's perfectly valid. As I said, human psychology is very uh, complex. I would not probably be a serial killer if I were a non-theist. I wouldn't rob banks because I just, I don't like danger. I kind of, 
thrills are okay, kind of, but, you know, I'd rather just, I'd probably go be the insurance salesman, you know, and that, if I had that choice. Um, I probably wouldn't do very well at that either, but anyway. Uh, I, uh, I would live probably a generally civil life. I'd cut corners here and there, but I probably wouldn't do some of those things. But people are different. And that's, that was my point there. Not that everybody's gonna, gonna do the wildest things possible, but just that some people are. So the existence of, of nice atheists is certainly not incompatible with my position. Uh, also, we have to keep in mind that, as I said, everybody knows right and wrong. I think everybody has a sense of this, this, this sense of ought. There's something I ought to be and do, whether they know the theoretical, theoretical foundation of it or not, or whether they acknowledge it or not. And so, there's gonna be inconsistency in a non-theist perspective. The non-theist is, is going to act sometimes as if there was a God. Now, uh, that's not exactly the same as saying a, a closet theist, but it comes somewhat close. It's saying, it's saying basically that the, the non-theist recognizes facts can, that can be only, only be explained by God, and in that sense recognizes God, and therefore is mo motivated by that. I'm sure you know Dr. Keller is motivated by all, by considerations of of the intrinsic value of human beings and thing, things of that sort. It just doesn't have an, a theoretical foundation for how they could exist. So he's borrowing from the theistic perspective to be able to do that. In fact, to criticize theism, he's borrowing from the theistic perspective because he's saying there are unethical uh, theists and ethical atheists. But ethical means doing what you ought to do. There are no oughts in non-theism. So he has to borrow from theism to criticize theism in that regard. Uh, with regard to theism leading to relativism, here's a big, this is a very big and very important claim, which basically a number of these claims were very similar, uh, in that the argument was that if you try to base ethics on God, well, there's a, there's a problem that nobody really knows what God wants, is the, is the assumption, the objection. We have all kinds of different religions, we have different interpretations of scripture, we have all these differences, and so it's impossible to know what God wants, therefore it's not a practical foundation. However, um, I disagree with the assumption of that objection. Uh, it may seem, there are lots of different religions in the world, that's very true, but the existence of disagreement does not prove that, uh, that there's no truth to be known or found. Um, I, I'd like to see this position held out in practice. I call, it, I call it the good and intelligent people disagree argument. It's basically the argument that whenever you find substantial disagreement, it must be because there's no way to know who's right. But nobody holds that consistently. If you, if you hold that consistently, then I, then I want you to see, every time you come across uh, a number of people who disagree with you, I want you to drop your belief right then and there. Oh, we can't know, because people disagree on it. The existence of disagreement does not indicate lack of evident truth. There are other reasons for disagreement. Uh, the, uh, the analogy of uh, different people being different religions because they live in different places is very true. I, I pointed that out myself a number of times, because most people don't really care about truth. Most people do believe what they believe for non-rational reasons. The, vast, the, the world is full of people who care nothing about truth. In fact, I'm a Presbyterian. One of, one of our beliefs is that human beings are basically rebels in, against God. We're running away from God. We're evil by nature. We hate truth. So it's really not very surprising to see the world trying to justify itself by inventing false religions and all kinds of things to avoid recognizing the truth. This happens all the time. It's, it's as much predicted from our point of view as from, from the, the non-theistic point of view. It's not surprising at all that that's the case. And, and it doesn't take Presbyterianism. You don't have to be a Presbyterian to see that, that fact. Look around you. How many people really are just saying, oh, gosh, I, just, I want to find the real truth in life. I don't want to be, I don't want to just go with what I was raised with or, or, what, I, or what I like. I, I want to just find what's real and I'll do anything. I'll just, I'll sacrifice anything to any amount to, to, to believe in truth. Is that, is that the world that we live in, full of people like that? No. The vast majority of people in the world, even just from an observational perspective, they grow up, they believe what they believe because they've been taught it, they never question it, and so they live and die in it. So it's, that's, that's very explainable, that's very true, but it doesn't prove that it's impossible to tell what religion is true or what interpretation of the Bible is true, anything of that sort. Um, you know, we have the quote from Proverbs and then the quote from Ecclesiastes and then the quote from the New Testament. Uh, that that uh, no, it's easy to you know come up with quotes that, that appear contradictory if you don't look at context and things like that. Um, you know, it, we should seek wisdom, but yet in wisdom is much much vexation. Are these contradictory? Oh, is, it, is, that, is that obviously so? We should seek wisdom. We should seek knowledge, but knowledge does cause knowledge causes sorrow. Is that such an, an amazingly obvious contradiction there? Or the New Testament saying, "I will destroy the wisdom of the wise." If you look at the context of that. Uh, what uh, what uh, God is uh, saying there is that 
is that I will destroy the apparent wisdom of the wise. The context is that God's wisdom is wiser than, than the stupid, ridiculous ideas we come up with as human beings. And God's wisdom will destroy what appears to be wisdom in the world. No contradiction. But it's easy to come up with those if you're looking for, you know, try to present an argument that doesn't look in, in great detail on it. So I just deny the, I deny the premise. Uh, I do believe it's possible to know what the Bible says. I do believe it's impossible to know what religion is true. Um, so I haven't, I haven't heard any good arguments except that people disagree for why, why you can't do that. Um, so I would deny that, that ethical theism is ambiguous in that sense. Now for the positive case, grounding ethics in the natural world. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't agree with all the facts that you know, Dr. Keller states. I'm, I'm, I'm not an evolutionist, for one thing. But it doesn't really matter to the argument because so what? Okay, let's say that the human race evolved a, a desire not to, to kill people and uh, all kinds of, you feel bad when you rob banks and stuff like that. And, and, you, and we have self-awareness. We, we're aware I exist, you exist. Uh, you can be hurt, I can be hurt. Sure. But he's committing the fallacy I talked about. The, you, you, the disconnect between the is and the ought. So what? I exist, you exist. You can be hurt, I can be hurt. How does that tell me what I ought to do? So what if people are hurt? It's a meaningless universe. There's no purpose for the universe. People don't have intrinsic value because there's no intrinsic valuer. There's no one who's at the back of all things who can give meaning to that. All we come down to is, oh, I like people. But this doesn't give me any normative uh, obligation any more than if somebody likes their puppy dog a whole lot, I therefore should too. It may seem more obvious, but think about what's going into that. You know that people have intrinsic value. But here, the non-theist is trying to say, is trying to derive an obligation from a simple fact that just doesn't, isn't supported by the, by the world view. So what if we become self-aware? Why should I care about human beings? Why ought I to care? Perhaps I might care because I have some evolved tendency. Perhaps I might not. I don't think it's as simple as that. I think that's psychologically narrow. But even more importantly, why should I care? Why shouldn't I overcome that, that instinct if I have it? Now, People have all kinds of strange instincts. I mean, I don't particularly care for spiders all that much. But I don't feel ethically obligated to stay away from them. I could, Darwinists could come up with, ex, with explanations for why I hate spiders, just as like they come up with explanations for anything in the universe, because that's, they love to come up with speculative explanations for everything that could possibly exist. But they cannot tell me why I ought to stay away from spiders, and therefore they can't. Likewise, if I happen to like people because of some evolutionary instinct, that doesn't tell me why I should. Why should I care? Why shouldn't I desensitize myself? If I'm going to become some, you know, a, a dictator and, and some, I know it's extreme, but a dictator in some country or something, or, and I'm going to say, well, the good of the, the many outweighs the good of the few. Let's crush a few people and destroy some human rights for the sake of the greater society. Why should I not do that? I want to know why I should not do that. I don't want to know what sort of evolutionary traits I have. I don't know what kind of instincts I have or how, or how, how happy you are about people. I want to know what I should and shouldn't do. I heard nothing whatsoever to provide a foundation for that perspective. Just an assertion. Oh, I'm self-aware, therefore I ought to treat people well. Why? What's the foundation? What's the basis of it? I didn't hear any explanation of that in, in any of, 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 the, uh, of what I heard. Um, reason for a reason, I agree. We should be, we should be rational. But it's an assumption, it's an, an ungrounded assumption that reason means non-supernatural. There's no, I, there's no argument that's been made for that. I disagree. I think that you can be reasonable and believe in the supernatural. In fact, I don't think you can be reasonable and not believe in the supernatural, ultimately. David, 10 minutes for your response. <clears throat> Boy, this is really a lot of fun. It's not like your normal philosophy conference where, uh, you know, you have prepared remarks. And I've never been in a debate before, and I hope I'm in a lot more because they're uh, they're more spontaneous, and you got to think on your feet. And uh, and uh, I, there's nothing I'd rather do on a Friday night than spend it all with you up here at the University of Utah. Me too. Mark and I are in absolute agreement that for ethics we need a robust conception of obligation, of moral duty of obligation. Um, 
But on the source of that obligation, we differ. Mark believes that unless we have a transcendent being, a source, above the natural world, we will have no source for obligation. I believe that it is absolutely superfluous and unnecessary to have a supernatural source for moral obligation and that we can indeed derive a robust notion of moral obligation and moral duty from the natural world. Mark claimed to, you know, that I didn't provide a good explanation of it in my opening remarks, so I'd like to revisit it again. If I'm self-aware, if I'm aware that I'm in a web work of relationships with you out there and with other living organisms in an ecological system, and I realize through my own inner life that I am a subject, that I am an end in myself, and that I have intrinsic value above and beyond the instrumental value that I may have to you or as a member of a biotic community in a food chain or something like that, if I have intrinsic value and I notice that you have similar traits that I do, by analogy, I will infer that you all are subjects as well, that you are ends in yourselves, that you have intrinsic value above and beyond instrumental value for me. And so it's the awareness of myself as a subject in the world and my reasoning and my observation that you, by analogy, are probably like me, although, truthfully, you could be automatons sent here by alien beings and you're really robotic and not ends in yourselves, but outwardly, empirically, you look like sentient beings to me. And I'm going to assume, for the sake of ethics, that you have intrinsic value. That, I believe, is the ground for non-egoistic moral obligation. If I'm an end in myself and I have intrinsic value, I assume you do too, and that I should act in such a way as to respect your autonomy, your inherent value above and beyond your instrumental value. So I believe that we can derive a robust sense of obligation to other beings worthy of moral considerability in the world independently of any supernatural source such as God. On the is-ought problem, this is a favorite one for philosophers to talk about. The idea is that it is a fallacy, in the words of one philosopher, the naturalistic fallacy to attempt to derive an ought from an is. And that's what Mark is bringing to our attention this evening. The idea is this. In the natural world, if you observe that the lawn is brown and somebody says to you, water the lawn, there is a prescription that is being snuck in to the simple description that the lawn is brown. Water the lawn is based on the idea that a brown lawn is a bad thing and that you cannot derive a prescription, an ought, from a description, an is, and that therefore it's a fallacy to derive an ought from a description of the natural world. The is-ought problem is only a problem, however, if you believe in a mechanical view of nature, that nature has no intrinsic value, no purpose in and of itself, that it just chugs along automatically like a machine, and if the machine breaks, who cares, it doesn't matter, it's broken, 
the machine has no intrinsic value, purpose, or direction in and of itself. It's just running. But I adamantly disagree that nature is properly described in only mechanical terms. If you believe that the natural world has purpose and value and direction as all living things exhibit, you can derive an ought from an is easily. The description... Hold your applause. A description of a biological being includes what it takes for that being to flourish. And a description of what would be damaging to that being. And so an ought, on more of an organismic view of nature, not a mechanical view of nature, an organismic view of nature would be such that you ought to act as to promote and further the flourishing of other beings of intrinsic value, in other words, living beings, or at least not damage them. So if you have more of a robust, informed biological view of nature and not a flat, sterilized mechanical view of nature, deriving an ought from an is is easily done, contrary to what Mark would lead us to believe. I will be very honest with you. I am not a Bible scholar. I do have the Oxford Revised Standard Version on my shelf. The example that I gave that Mark appropriately ridiculed me for was not my own. That was a real example, in my experience from Utah Valley State College. An evangelical Christian student was very troubled by whether she should study ethics because she felt like any moral action she took in her life should come directly from God. It was inappropriate for her to have the arrogance of a secular humanist like myself to assume that she could decide for herself what was morally correct action in this world. I said, why would you think that? She gave me those Bible quotes and I wrote them down. That came from one of my students who really was genuinely troubled on whether to pursue a moral philosophy or not. She looked to the Bible for guidance because of her theological morality and she found inconsistent information. My answer to her, of course, was, well, God must have given you reason for a reason, so you might as well use it, enroll in Utah Valley State College, pay tuition, and that's all I can tell you. Most philosophers are guilty of arrogance, myself included. I detect a little bit of it in Mark as well. He said that the fact that different people have different practices, different religions around the world is an example of people not caring about the truth. Now, we could deconstruct that comment at length, but I worry that in that kernel, in that comment, lies a vestige of the view that people around the globe that practice the wrong religion aren't concerned with the truth. And that is the kind of divisiveness and tribalism that I don't believe the human condition benefits from. I believe that 
It's that kind of thinking that leads to intolerance and rather than rising above the differences that we, that we're all going to face, especially in an era of globalization, right? So I'm not sure that Buddhists aren't really concerned about the truth or Protestants or Zoroastrians or Jains or other religions. I'm not willing to judge whether they're on the wrong path to the truth or not. I would prefer to just learn about them. Okay, one minute. I'll end it there. Thank you. Mark did not take his entire time in his opening statement, so that gave us a few minutes before we are supposed to, before we are scheduled to take our five-minute break, after which, of course, they will be coming back and asking questions directly, asking questions to each other, and then they'll be giving a closing statement for five minutes, and then, of course, the audience will get a chance to speak. But because we still have a few minutes left, because Mark didn't finish, take the entire 20-minute time that was allotted to him, perhaps I, as the moderator, would like to perhaps ask one or two questions, raise one or two issues, which I find to be rather nagging, and I do not believe that the two sides adequately responded to them, and I would like to invite them to comment on them. That way, maybe we can bring them together almost face-to-face. Short, quick questions, and perhaps quick answers. According to Mark, his opening statement was that we can't have obligation and values without God, that in a godless world, no moral responsibility, no obligation, and no values possible if we just have a world of facts, including people's desires and needs and wants, then we cannot derive values and obligations from facts. As a philosopher, we have some fancy names for this problem, which Mark cited, but I would like to ask Mark this question, and I would like to then see David's response to it, which is this, by presuming that God exists, by extending the world of facts from the natural realm to the supernatural realm, Mark simply extended the world of facts, presuming that existence of God is a fact, which is, of course, a bit presumption, because theists and atheists could disagree on that, but let's presume, based on Mark's logic, that God is a fact. So that means, again, we are stuck with the world of facts. How does Mark intend to derive values and obligations from an extended world of facts by his own logic? That's my question to Mark, and I would like to then see David's response. It will be very brief, because I have perhaps one or two other questions. Yeah, thank you. Good question. I don't think they can hear. Can you hear? Can you hear out there all right? All right, I can hear. Yeah, that's a very good question. I do think that God is a fact, and that's true. I would think that the – I don't think the is-ought dilemma is absolute. I would think, in other words, that you can't derive ethics from facts. Obviously, you have to derive ethics from facts eventually. Otherwise, they would derive from nothing, because there's nothing that's not a fact in some sense. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. But I would – my argument better would be that – better put would be that you can't derive ethics from any other fact beyond the existence of God, because God would be an absolute person who's the ground of all being, who's the source and context of reality, who therefore his desires would have the ability to be a normative – to be a – to provide ethical obligation for us, because he created us for a purpose, and we exist – we're supposed to fulfill that purpose, and so on. So I think the fact of God, being who God is, is capable of being the ground of obligation. But facts in the – that when you don't have God, you don't have anything but descriptive facts in the sense that can't produce obligation. Very good. David? Yeah, 
even within the Abrahamic tradition, at least in my limited understanding, Jews, Christians, and Muslims have significantly different ideas of the personality of God. And in Mark's opening remarks, he even emphasized the fact that the theism that he is talking about holds up as an ideal the personalistic concept of a deity, which of course is much different than other religions. I do not see any way of deriving oughts from the is of God's existence, even if you accept the fact of a monotheistic, transcendent, personalistic deity. Is God loving? Does God demand obedience? Is God wrathful? All three, sometimes those attributes seem inconsistent or at least incoherent. I believe that it's much safer to try to derive oughts from an is based on the naturalistic world, which is empirically verifiable right in front of us, rather than a personalistic deity, which by definition is beyond the pale of our observation. Okay. First question. What is it that gives you intrinsic value? You talked about you have intrinsic value and see other people who are like you and therefore they have intrinsic value. But what is it that then gives you intrinsic value beyond just you like yourself, you've evolved to like yourself, other people might like you, and so on? What does it mean to have intrinsic value? How do you get that? Intrinsic value, to have intrinsic value is to have a direction or a purpose. And so all life, insofar as all life has a direction or a purpose, has intrinsic value. So my ethics are based probably in large part because of my interest and training in environmental ethics and environmental philosophy, life-centered. I believe that all organisms, all living things, have intrinsic value insofar as they can flourish and be healthy or be damaged and not flourish. And that there is a clear criterion based in biology by which we can assess what it means for a particular organism to flourish depending on what kind of organism it is. And we can easily derive oughts from is based on the description of biological processes. So inanimate objects, on my definition, would not have intrinsic value, only living beings. But one other thing, to have intrinsic value means you're worthy of moral considerability. Not all beings that are worthy of moral considerability are moral agents. We are moral agents because we're self-aware, we're aware of ourselves in the biosphere, but other beings such as the brown grass that wishes it was green is not a moral agent, but it's worthy of moral considerability. I have a follow-up question to that. You talk about things having a purpose, but if things are not created by a being who has a purpose for their existence, if we came into existence, ultimately there's no reason why we exist, impersonal forces, impersonal causes, non-intentionality creates us, then we don't exist for a purpose and nothing exists for a purpose. It may actually do something factually, but it doesn't seem to have a goal. A purpose would mean an ideal that it's fulfilling that someone has. So how can you say that things that are not created for a purpose have a purpose? I believe that the natural world is intrinsically creative, that it's intrinsically energetic, that there's a creativity embedded in nature, and that many indigenous religions around the world that are not transcendental, monotheistic, 
are completely cognizant and aware of this creativity that is intrinsic to nature. Animism might be one kind of awareness of this built-in purposiveness in nature. I do not believe that purpose in nature has to have a supernatural source. I believe that purpose in nature, based on the energetics of matter, makes nature itself purposive and energetic. Why, I don't know, but water freezes in a certain way and often creates very interesting patterns on the surface of the lake. Why did those crystalline formations appear on the surface of a frozen lake? There's clearly a structure there. There's a shape. Was that pattern, is the pattern a manifestation of some sort of divine being, or is there something intrinsic to matter itself that is responsible is not the right word. The pattern itself is a manifestation of creativity in matter itself. I do not believe, I don't see what is to be gained by explaining purposiveness in nature by bringing in a supernatural source. You talked about the disagreement that exists in the religious world as kind of an evidence or at least a side effect of the fact that theistic ethics in your view are unverifiable and therefore impractical because you can't tell what God wants. But what about disagreements in the, you know, also between naturalists and others? I mean, if disagreement indicates that truth and evidence, evidence can't exist for truth to be known. So, for example, Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and all these people exist and therefore truth, we can't know who's right or people interpret the Bible differently and therefore you can't know which interpretation is right. Then why couldn't we say that, I mean, humanists constitute a very small portion of the population of Earth. So why couldn't the disagreement with humanists and others indicate that we can't know whether non-theism also is right? Geez, I'm not sure that humanists are, constitute a real small population of Mother Earth. Anyway, that is irrelevant to the question at hand. The question at hand is how are we going to derive normative standards by which we conduct our lives? And I do not believe that looking to a supernatural source by which is going to be highly contentious and highly debatable does the human condition any good whatsoever. In your view, if somebody has, in your view, if somebody has a, somebody wants to live the sort of life of thrills like I talked about, you know, rob banks or do something like that, live a life of crime for the sake of the thrills, for the sake that they can make new friends in their, you know, in their own, in their new circles so they can, they can fulfill themselves in various ways. Why would you say that it's inherently irrational or unethical for a person to, to pursue those kinds of lifestyles as opposed to other lifestyles that other people find contentment in? That's very easy to answer. A life of crime and a life of hedonism is unethical insofar as it impinges on the rights of others to pursue their intrinsic rights. So just because something is against the law does not make it unethical. What makes living a life of crime unethical is the degree to which your actions are inhibiting the liberties of others to pursue their, their ideals. Same with, same with hedonism. So no, no, no deference to theology there at all. Just good old down, down to earth humanistic ethics. Are there examples, you mentioned examples of religious violence, which I of course acknowledge. 
other examples of violence from non-religious people that are, could be influenced by philosophies uh, that are non-theistic in nature? Have, have those occurred in history? <clears throat> Boy, uh, 20th century is replete with examples of non-theistic violence. Um, uh, uh, there's distorted, perverted interpretations of Marx uh, in, in, in the person of Stalin is a good example, and the fascism of Mussolini and Hitler are other good examples of, of, uh, of non-theistic ideologies which beget violence. Why don't you, David, ask a few questions. <clears throat> How am, uh, if I am uh, at a point in my life where I am determining uh, how I should construct my, my moral framework by which I should lead my life, and I choose and I decide, um, and I've, I've attended this evening's uh, a debate, and I've, I've heard you speak, and I'm absolutely convinced that theistic ethics is, uh, provides a good uh, heuristic by which for me to live my life. How do I then proceed methodologically to, um, to choose the supernatural framework by which I am going to build my ethics? Um, in a broad sense, my answer would be you know, the same as how you choose any viewpoint. Look at the evidence to see what it is, uh, where it leads to. Um, I think if you're convinced by this, then, you, then you're probably convinced that, that God exists, for one thing, that, that God exists and is defined in a monotheistic uh, sense. Um, so you're going to look at different theistic religions. You're going to look at Islam and Christianity and Judaism and other, other uh, uh, forms of, of theistic religion and look and see which one conforms to reality better. You know, just, just as you make any decision about what's true, you take a claim, you compare it to reality, you see what, what matches and what doesn't. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I won't go into the details of it, but I, I think that the answer is that Christianity will show itself to be con to conform to reality better than those others and, and, and uh, answer questions and adequately explain things that the others cannot. You know, such as uh, human uh, wickedness, uh, the, uh, the personal nature of God, um, the, and a number of other things as well, uh, how, we, how we are saved from wickedness in terms of justice and things of that sort. Uh, and I think that, that all these provide adequate evidence to conclude that Christianity is, is true, leading you to then look to uh, God's revelation in terms of, of nature as well as in terms of the Bible as a source of revelation, which I believe can be interpreted uh, accurately uh, and doesn't and isn't inherently un impossible to understand I agree so I look at the evidence and I I look out at our fellow human beings the panoply of humanity out in front of me and I conclude that yes indeed there is a lot of wickedness um, but then I also uh, I also conclude um, a la Confucius, that there seems to be a lot of, of uh, in, inherent goodness in humanity. And so I'm perplexed on, on whether, you know, human beings are in an in, uh, inherently fallen state, um, as Christianity would um, uh, uh, purport, or or whether we're really not in a fallen state and the, the, the human condition has problems, but um, there's a lot to uh, cherish and, and, uh, and, and applaud. And, and so I'm not sure, uh, you know, whether I should turn to Christianity or Confucianism. Um, why, why, would I, why would I choose a religion of transcendental uh, monotheism over a non-theistic uh, tradition like Buddhism or or uh, Confucianism, or something like that? Um, to, to, I'll try to answer briefly that, that question. Um, in terms of the last part first, theism as opposed to a, an impersonal uh, foundation. Uh, Buddhism and some of those religions are a little difficult to determine exactly where they, where they go sometimes, and different forms of them go different ways in terms of whether you have a personal God or not. But um, I think that if you're convinced by the, the debate, 
then you're going to move in the direction of a personal God, which is going to lead you to some form of theism. In terms of whether – why Christianity seems particularly true, it seems to fit reality better in terms of human wickedness, let's say. I can't go into great detail, but it's true that there are a lot of nice people and do nice things in the world. But what is virtue? Is virtue people doing nice things sometimes? Or is virtue – would virtue result in people doing the right thing all the time, ultimately? If a person does the right thing all the time except when they're in certain situations and it's inconvenient to them, then are they ethical? So there are lots of ways to be ultimately not grounded in what's good and yet live a nice life. Even Hitler was nice sometimes. Nobody's going to do bad things all the time in every possible respect. That wouldn't be the case. You look at some of the experiments. I was just reading – I subscribe to eSkeptic. I was just – by Michael Shermer. I was just reading his thing the other day, and he was interviewing Philip Zimbardo, who did the Stanford Prison Experiment. I won't go into details on it, but that and the experiment with the people who are giving electric shocks, if you've heard of these. Normal, nice people who do terrible things when they're put in certain situations. Human nature sometimes hides itself under all kinds of guises. We also have natural affection and sympathy that keeps us from doing things. I mean, Hitler probably – there's some people Hitler wouldn't want to kill because he likes them. His natural affection, sympathy perhaps. But if you are nice to Germans and not others because you like Germans, you feel sympathetic towards them but not others, is that ethics? So there's a lot of questions we can look at here, but there's just a little bit of a direction I might go in to answer the question. I'm convinced that I need to look to a theistic being for my standards of conduct, but I'm not sure why this being has to be a personalistic being. Why, when I look at the natural world and all of the imperfections of design of my own body – for example, I wish I had a snorkel that came out of the top of my head for breathing instead of having this design that involves the breathing along with the eating – why would God be in a personalistic form when I look at the natural world? A pantheism seems much more empirically verifiable and logically consistent. Well, I think that basically you have to have a personal being who is at the back of all things because only a person has ideals, has values, has goals, has purposes that they can therefore become the official ideals of the universe. This gives me the opportunity to use a little bit of an analogy that I wanted to use in the opening statement but forgot to use. If you compare God's relationship to the universe with, say, George Lucas's relationship to the Star Wars universe – okay. George Lucas, he's the ground of being. He's the source and context of reality in the Star Wars universe. Now, this gives him all kinds of powers in that universe. One thing it gives him is the ability – his viewpoint is what is in that universe. What George Lucas thinks, what he intends, his view of things is exactly what is because reality is grounded on him in that universe. So if George Lucas says Darth Vader is a bad guy, Darth Vader is a bad guy. If Darth Vader disagrees and has a different perspective on ethics and wants to argue with him, George Lucas wins because his viewpoint constitutes the official evaluative norms of reality because he's the ground of being, because he's a person. If Star Wars were to somehow evolve without an author, just sort of randomly occurring, there would be no way to judge whether it's a good ending or a bad ending or what purpose anybody serves in the novel. There would be no good characters or bad characters, any kind of normative sense, objective sense. The characters might like or dislike various things, but there would be no viewpoint coming from the author to determine what really is good or bad objectively. God provides that in this universe. He determines what is good and bad. His viewpoint is what is. So if you don't have a person at the back and ground of reality, the source of reality, then you don't have any kind of normative evaluation for what's good and bad. I've traveled through Asia, and I noticed that people there seem very calm and content and peaceful, but they typically were Buddhist. And so I'm wondering how millions, perhaps a billion people 
could lead what I, as a moral philosopher, would define as an ethical life without having the benefit of transcendental monotheism. How are they able to get along? Will they be better off once they um, uh, um, have the benefit of a personalistic uh, deity to follow? Um, I would say that there's a number of explanations for, for that uh, that probably are all go together. Well, one of them would be that uh, in terms of being ethical, people, as I said, are going to be ethical because they recognize the reality of ethical obligation, whether they have a consistent explanation for how it occurs or not. I mean, humanists and atheists are very ethical people too. I mean, uh, they, they tend to be very strong on emphasizing human rights, for example. Um, in the East, you can see the same thing. The question is whether they have a ground for it or whether they're perceiving a reality they don't have an explanation for that they can't account for. I would assert that to be the case. In terms of, you know, are they are they really ethical? Well, you know, what what constitutes ethics? Once we decide what the source of ethics is, then we can say, well, how can we? If we decide God's the source of ethics, we can ask, how do we know what God wants? And then we we look at that. What if God ultimately? What if the central point of ethics, what if the real foundation for what is, is good is, is God himself? What if God, what if love for God, following God's rules because they're God's rules, following him, having respect for God ultimately, is what makes a person ethical? What if God created us for his own glory? Then a person who doesn't believe in God might be very nice and respectful in various ways, but he would not, but they would not be ethical in an absolute sense, in an ultimate objective sense, because they would miss the real heart, the real core of what it means to be ethical. Similar to the way you argue that theists will are not well, are are not as laudable and not as praiseworthy in their their actions because they don't do it for the right reason. Okay. Um, before we get to ask them to sum up their positions in five minutes each and then open it up for audience questions, I would like to ask the moderator, perhaps ask one more question or even maybe two questions. Uh, as I see the way the two of them are talking, perhaps we need to find some points of commonality. One issue that's coming up again and again is the issue of what constitutes intrinsic value, what constitutes objective moral value. Where is it that morals come from? That's a question that's coming up again and again. So in view of that, if we ask the question, what makes an act a moral act, if we say that it's because of God or God commands it, and if we don't want to make it sound as if it's a blind trust in authority, which is not moral, we have to have some sort of an understanding what makes it moral? What makes it moral that we follow God? Now, that question itself presumes that moral, morality or moral standards or moral values are outside of God. Otherwise, we would not be asking that question. So maybe there is something going on there. I would like to see if there is any answer to that question, which is, of course, a tough philosophical question, from either side in responding to the issue of what constitutes intrinsic value, where values come from, anything like that. My microphone stand apart. No. Um, so the question is why, you know, if we're asking what makes something moral, then, I mean, basically it's not like the question is why should we follow what God says? Why is it moral to follow what God says? Uh, if, if we, uh, there has to be an explanation that comes from beyond that, it seems like, to say why is it moral to follow God? Is that my understanding correctly? Yeah, if we don't want it to be a blind faith in authority, which is not moral, then we have to have some answer for that. Why should you follow God? Doesn't that itself show that morality is outside of God? That's a philosophical question. Okay. I would like to see each of you answer to that. Question. Okay. Um, no, I, I think that uh, ultimately there's a, a rational explanation for what it is about God that makes him the ground of morality. I, said, I think it's because he's an absolute person. He's a person who is the ground of all reality, who's the source of reality. The fact that he is that makes his viewpoint the official viewpoint of the universe. And therefore, I think just when you talk about oughts, when you talk about the, I ought to do this, a certain person has intrinsic value, there's human rights, how, whatever you talk about, you're talking about an ideal, a standard for the way things ought to be, a, a, something that, that things are supposed to fulfill, some, some goal for things. And when you talk about goals and ideals, you just are talking about some person's ideals. 
But if you're talking about objective value, objective oughts, then you're talking about some person who's objective uh, to us, who's not just, well, what I think or what you think, what I love, what you love, but what are we supposed to love? What are we made for? Uh, what, wh whose viewpoint defines the way things really are? Whose desires define the desires that are really desirable, ultimately, in an absolute sense, in the universe? So I think that, the, that it's very, ra I think a rational uh, basis is that God, being a person who is the foundation of reality, makes him, um, rationally, the only possible foundation for the sorts of things that ethical obligations are. You can't get them any other way. And I, so I think that's the rational reason why that's the case. David? We, <clears throat> we have intrinsic value because we're persons. My definition of a person is somebody who is the subject of a life, somebody who has dreams, aspirations, plans, ambitions, purposes. And something is unethical if an action of another agent inhibits those dreams, aspirations, ambitions, and goals. There is nothing mysterious, supernatural, theological about it. My ethics are grounded firmly in the natural world. Okay, with that, we'd like to ask each of them to su summarize their position in five minutes before we open it up to the audience. I would like to ask David first to take five minutes to give his statement. I really want to hear what uh, you all have to say. This debate could not have occurred in a theocracy because the, the values of a religion would have determined a priori, before the debate had even started, what would be appropriate to have been said and not to have said. The fact that we are having a debate is a result of the fact that we live in a secular, humanistic, political structure. And that allows each one of us to determine the values that we will li live our lives by, whether they're theological values or not, if they're theological values, whether they're one of the Abrahamic traditions, a pantheistic tradition, a poly polytheistic tradition, and so on. The beautiful thing about secular liberal political philosophy is that it lets us decide what kind of values we are going to live our lives by. Uh, grounding ethics in uh, theology is fine on a personal level, and, uh, but I don't think it's necessary. I believe that, that um, it's much more productive for the human condition to ground our ethics in something that is more easily agreed upon than religious dogma. And that more easily agreed upon criterion, as I have argued tonight, is biology and natural science and empirically verifiable things that we see in our daily lives. And we have a very uh, a clear criterion by how we treat our fellow human beings who are centers of intrinsic value if an action of mine inhibits you from flourishing, it's unethical. Um, when we go down the theological road, there are so many uh, vagaries that it does ethics no good whatsoever. So on a personal level, uh, um, uh, um, it's okay. Uh, for some people, I believe that theism is the right uh, way to pattern your life. Um, but that is not universally, universally true for all human beings on a, on, uh, on a social and political level, which is ethics, communal ethics. I believe it's much more safe to avoid theism and religion altogether and found uh, public policy solely and securely on a humanistic, secular foundation. Yeah, I, 
totally agree with that that basic assessment in the sense of that we need to ground our ethics as a society and as human beings on what is – yes, thank you. I seem to be having that problem throughout the night here. We should ground ethics as persons, as individuals, and as a community on what's rational, on what's real, what really is. But a question we haven't debated, which would be another question worth debating, is what's really real? Is this really a naturalistic universe where God doesn't exist, or is this a universe where God does exist and perhaps a particular religion is true, Christianity, for example? How do we – we haven't judged the arguments one way or the other on that, but I would assert exactly the same thing, that we should base it on what's really real, what's rational. I believe that what is rational is not a naturalistic view of the world, but a view of the world in which we recognize the reality that God exists, that we are creatures of God, that we exist to fulfill the purposes of God, to do what God wants us to do. And if we do that, then not only are we doing what we ought to do, but I do believe also we're doing what's in our best interest because we have also been – things have also been set up in a universe that now is concerned about justice because it's a personal universe. We have a universe that will bring things to justice, that will reward the good and punish the bad, ultimately. And so it is in our best interest also to do what is good. And it's best to recognize what's real. So I think as individuals in a society, we should recognize the reality that ethical obligation cannot exist apart from the ideals of God, the values of God, the purposes of God being the foundation of them, and that we should pattern our lives according to what those values are as we try to find out what they are. And I think that when we look at that, we'll find – it will lead us to an understanding of the Christian religion, ultimately, as being the way things really are, which is no more arrogant or absurd to say than to say that the non-theist world is real. They're different positions. Which one is right? We look at the evidence. We look at what can really explain reality, and we determine things on that basis. And I think that we've seen – I'm convinced by the arguments, obviously, and I hope you can see it as well. I hope you are convinced as well that there's just no way to account for it. We haven't heard any explanation. All we've heard, people are people. People are persons who have minds and wills. They get hurt by people. Why should I care? I don't think we've heard an explanation for that beyond that we exist in a universe where things really do have value because there's an ultimate valuer who values things in an objective sense beyond just what I like or what you like and so on. And we have a universe that cares about justice, and therefore we have a universe that gives us an ultimate motivation to do what's right in two ways. One, out of respect and love for God and who he is because of who he is. Because he is who he is, therefore we love him and follow him as the ultimate reason. And secondarily, because it's in our own best interest, because we are going towards a judgment of good and evil in the end that's absolute and ultimate. So that would be my conclusion. For a forum like this, audience input, audience participation is vital. So we have a microphone over here. So if you don't mind, please come over there, ask your question, make your questions brief, succinct, and to the point, and clearly direct it to one of the speakers, one of the two speakers, and let them speak. Again, when they answer, I would ask them to be brief as well, so that we can entertain as many questions as possible. So, over there, your first question, sir. I have a question for Dr. Keller. In the 1930s, the National Socialists in Germany looked within themselves and saw what they believed to be intrinsic value, but in looking at other parts of their society, particularly those that were senile and those that suffered with Down syndrome, they saw that they did not have the dreams, goals, and aspirations in the same way that they did and no longer saw them as having the same intrinsic value. They saw them, in fact, as stopping the overall society from flourishing to, uh, in very difficult circumstances and saw it as artificial that in other parts of the biological world the weak would have been weeded out through predators and other things. Therefore, they introduced a program of involuntary euthanasia, a program that was praised in the New York Times and in large sections of the United States. This is all back in the 1930s. How would you tell them that they were wrong in doing this uh, program of involuntary euthanasia? 
Wow, excellent question. Um, I would tell them that they should give up their holistic political philosophy and quit uh, um, basing their ethics on the good of the the whole and recognize a, a, a pluralism where there's uh, a multitude of centers of intrinsic value and that 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 all beings um, independently of of race, religion, um, uh, uh, um, disability, and so on and so forth are centers of intrinsic value and that that value cannot be forsaken by the good of, of, of the whole. I would presume that you would give the same response to those folks also who kill in the name of God, would you? <clears throat> yes. Uh, um, uh, I believe, you know, I, my, my position is just um, uh, stock uh, enlightenment liberalism where each one of us as, as individuals have intrinsic value that cannot be um, transgressed for the sake of something else, be it God's will or uh, national socialism. Uh, it's the same, the same problem in a different dressing. And so uh, that would be my response. Um, uh, what the Nazis did to, to homosexuals and, and Jews and people with disabilities uh, um, uh, was, was unethical because it was a transgression of intrinsic human rights. Next question. Uh, yes, this is for Dr. Keller. Um, one of the things that I noticed is when you were talking about, it seemed like you were struggling to come up with a purpose behind life in the world. And it seems to me that it probably takes more faith, doesn't it take more faith to come up with this purpose if you don't have God? If it's just something subjective? Uh, to define it as something more than just your opinion? I struggle all the time to come up with <laughs> descriptions that, uh, um, that I'm trying to express. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the recognition of life and purpose in life is subjective. Acorns grow into oak trees, infants grow into adults, tadpoles grow into frogs. That is a, that's an empirical fact. Um, when, when I look around at the natural world, I see purpose in organisms. Um, uh, I don't claim to have an omniscient view to explain why tadpoles grow into frogs or what the purpose of life ultimately is, but um, uh, neither does the theist. Um, we're, um, because we're limited human beings rooted in a spatio-temporal uh, perspective, none of us has omniscience, and we better be agnostic, all of us, about why life exists. The better, uh, more healthy thing, uh, in my view, would be to... to, uh, to cherish the value of life and the, pur the purpose that all living things have and to base our ethics on whether we are enabling all uh, living things, including our fellow human beings, to flourish or not. Theism is totally irrelevant. Next question. And this one's for Mark, actually. Recently, I was told by a Christian friend of mine who happens to know that I am an atheist that he would never vote for an atheist for president because, by definition, atheists are less moral. Now, this incredibly offended me and basically made me feel that my friend viewed me as less of a person. I feel that that ties into morality. And um, the Christian notion that they can go around insulting those who lack faith and those who choose to denounce religion, organized religion, that they have the right to do that. They also have the right to denounce Allah or Yahweh or Buddha or any other. That they have this inherent right to go ahead and offend anyone else, but yet at the same time yell at me for being offensive towards them, for saying that I don't believe in God. It's offensive to Christians, but yet it's totally fine for them to offend me at any turn. How does that tie into morality? At the back of the room, I was just told tonight that 
my very feelings of being offended were wrong because my disbelief in God was wrong. So it's wrong for me to be offended when somebody tells me I'm wrong. I can't even feel offended. And that, to me, is amoral. Well, I think we should ultimately be saying what's true. And I think just I would agree with Richard Dawkins, for example, the author of The God Delusion. If religious people are inherently more prone to violence for some reason, say it. I'm not offended by reality or by the truth. I think that covering up the truth to avoid hurting people's feelings is a bad idea. However, I don't want to argue that atheists are immoral. And I will argue that ultimately they are doing things for the wrong reason. In an ultimate sense, they share the rebellion against God that we all share by nature. I think we all share it by nature. And the only salvation we have is by grace and mercy, all of us. If we're going to be saved, it's not going to be on the basis of our merit. But I think that atheists can be very nice people. And I think if an atheist became president, they could be a very good president in most ways, other than they wouldn't have a Christian foundation of things. They'd be basing it on an ultimately false worldview. But they could be nice. They could enact good laws. They could do all kinds of good things. I think atheists can do a lot of good things. And I don't think that it's true that atheists can't be ethical in a civil sense. And I wouldn't want to make that claim. I would argue that they don't have any reason why they ought to be that way. And some of them don't have a reason why they would even want to be that way necessarily if they thought about it more. But I think so there's a degree of inconsistency, I think, in some forms of that. I hope that helps a little bit. What was it? Why are Christians allowed to be judgmental against atheists, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews? Why is that an allowable form of morality? I don't really hear that question. The question was repeated, that why is it that Christians believe they have the right to pass judgments against all non-Christians and atheists, even including initiating violence? That was the question. By passing judgment, do you mean saying that a person's worldview is wrong? Yes. Well, I think that right and wrong and correctness and incorrectness is not a matter of a person's feelings but of reality. If I'm wrong, then I don't feel offended if somebody tells me so. But I want to know. I'm interested in reality, not just having my viewpoint that I like and defending it at all costs. I'm interested in reality. And so I don't take it offensive. I'm not offended when somebody tells me that they're wrong. Otherwise, I wouldn't be involved in a debate like this. And so I don't also hesitate to say when I think another – some belief is right or wrong. It's not a matter of whether it's my belief or your belief. The matter is reality. And let's try to look at the evidence and see what it says. Does that help? A little better. Next question. You both seem to be saying that ethics or morality is some sort of – provides some sort of actions in a golden rule kind of way and denying to yourselves and to the other sides the opportunity of acting in what I would say is a more laudable way, and that is out of a motivation of selfless love. I'd appreciate it if you'd each comment on that. I tried to address the idea of selfless love. The way that I described it was a recognition, a self-awareness of oneself in the world and that other beings, human and non-human, are worthy of moral considerability and that there might be – there are many times in which your self-interest is better served by transgressing on the flourishing of other beings. I believe that morality based on reason can enable us to rise above the selfish egoism and treat other beings in a selfless way. And again, I believe that that foundation is available to us in a secular, 
rational way and independently of theology and supernatural beings. Mark? I want to just make a couple points in response to that. One is that I do acknowledge, and I wanted to acknowledge this in the debate and didn't get around to it until now, but basically that I don't think that a non-theist position necessarily leads to totally focusing on self-interest. I think that some of the affections that we have are sympathy and natural affection, for example. I think an atheist can consistently love someone else and desire their welfare by sympathy and by just affection towards people. So I wouldn't want to limit it to that. I think that would be unfair to the non-theistic perspective to limit it to self-interest. However, in a non-theistic position, universe, there's no reason why you ought to have selfless love. You might, in fact, have it. You might not. Some people are different. But there's no reason why you ought to would be my assertion. Selfless love is not inherently better or worse than anything else unless you've got an ideal standard that you're comparing it to beyond, oh, I like selfless love and you don't. You've got to go beyond that. And I think God's values provide that foundation. When the person, I believe in selfless love because I believe that what we should ultimately do is not focus on ourselves as the foundation of all things, but we should ultimately love God for who he is in himself as the absolute foundation of ethics. And when we love God for who he is, we also see things the way he sees them. And therefore, we see the intrinsic value of human beings because God values them. And therefore, we have selfless love for human beings as well in the context of that. Next question. A couple of very quick comments for you. I appreciate the fact that you don't mind being told that you're wrong. I'll just start it by saying I think you're wrong. You're first confusing the ought with the standard itself. You can set up a standard without having an obligation to follow it necessarily. I can create some ethical absolute standards based off evolution and natural selection. The rest I can take care of with inalienable rights and social contract from the Enlightenment. There's no obligation to follow them. If you don't, you're less likely to survive or you'll get kicked out of the group. You have no obligation to follow God's standards other than you want a reward or you're trying to avoid a punishment. You have the same problem everybody else does. Finally, in every single statement you made, you said you're referring to reality and empiricism and checking things. You have no empirical evidence for God's existence or any of his standards. Let me know when you do. Okay. I think there were three questions there. Hold your applause. Hold your applause. Please let Mark respond. That's all right. You can clap for the question if you want. But anyway, there are three points basically there, if I can remember them all. I'm starting to forget them already. Okay. Okay. What was the first point? Let's see. Right. Okay. Yeah. Your position actually I think is a more consistent form of non-theism than David's because you recognize that there's no obligation beyond just, you know, the needs and desires of human beings. That's kind of what the Humanist Association, the American Humanist Association statement says as well, that we base it on human needs and desires. So it's not a matter of obligation in the sense of some objective oughts, but it's a matter of I'm going to be motivated to live a certain way. And to that I would say, well, that doesn't deal with, there is such a thing as ethical obligation. To discard it, to say, well, there's nothing I'm supposed to do. There's no intrinsic value to people that I ought to respect, I think violates what we all know. And I don't think that the non-theist position can provide adequate motivation for all people in all circumstances to live ethically, adequately. In terms of me having the same problem, I don't think I have the same problem because I think that I have a rational explanation for how you could have oughts. I've already gone over that a number of times, so I won't again. But I think that's a rational explanation for why you can have oughts. I think you can see the reason of it. And I think that I don't simply say that we should serve God, we should do what's right because of reward and punishment from God. In fact, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that's a motivation. It's a secondary motivation. Primarily, though, I think we ought to be motivated by what is right for its own sake, which means we love God for who he is and his values for what they are in themselves because they are what they are, because God is who he is as God and his values are what they are. That's the ultimate reason why we ought to do things. Secondarily, we're concerned with fear and punishment. Did I deal with all that? Yeah, we have to leave it at that. We have quite a few questions. Respond briefly and keep your questions short, please. All right, I'll try. 
You mentioned earlier that in one of your responses to Dr. Keller's like point about the good Buddhist that a person can be ethical without necessarily having a good reason or structure for being ethical. So I'm going to turn the question on you a little bit. Suppose, for example, as is the case in history, you have a number of different religions rising independently of each other and coming up with the same things, like general rules such as don't cheat on your neighbor, don't kill him for his land type of thing. And when questioned about this, they all give the exact reason that a divine being who represents like the whole of existence or the totality of existence told them that this is a good thing, that they should do this. So if I respect the claim, like for example, that I should do unto my neighbors as they should do, that I should do unto others as I would have them do unto, have them do unto me, and this claim is among these different independently rising religions, why should I follow your specific claim to truth, like Christianity, for example, over others in pursuing an ethical life? Briefly, my answer to that would be because I think there's good reason to. I think that Christianity has better evidence for being true than other religions. I think that it has the evidence of reality on its side. I know that sounds arrogant to people these days, but everybody claims that who believes anything. You think you're right, otherwise you wouldn't have any opinions. So I think that there's good evidence for why Christianity should be affirmed. Does that deal with the question? Mark, we are getting stuck again and again on that question of evidence. Can you perhaps cite what you take to be the strongest, by far the best evidence, one evidence, so that maybe people can have some idea of what we're getting at? It's kind of, it's more of cumulative than I'm going to be able to answer in just one thing, but let me give you just a hint of a list. The existence of God, I think there's good reason to believe that the monotheistic God exists. I think Thomas Aquinas' arguments are valid, cosmological argument, and various arguments in that regard. I think you can't explain anything without God, including ethics, as has been the point tonight. I don't think you can explain anything else without God either. As far as Christians' view of human nature, I think it bears out in my awareness of my own nature as being naturally rebellious against God, and I think it bears itself out in looking at history as well. Yes, people do nice things and also bad things, but I think that when we look at reality, we see people who have convenient reasons to be virtuous, but aren't virtuous all the time, because ultimately they are doing what they want to do. I think we see a world full of people who do what they want to do, basically, and aren't really all that concerned with truth and morality in an ultimate strong kind of way, except when it follows some degree of convenience. That fits the Christian view of humanity. Christianity proposes an answer to the solution to the human problem of what we call sin, human wickedness, in that Jesus, the Son of God, took upon himself our sins and suffered for them, giving us his righteousness by which we can be saved. This is the only possible solution if you take justice seriously in the universe than any other system. I don't have time to go into the details of it, but I think that bears out by the evidence. There's other kinds of things that can be done clean as well, but I think all these sort of cumulative things lead to that conclusion. Just one quick question. When Christians themselves can't agree amongst themselves as to the real truth, the reality, or the correct interpretation, where the non-Christians or the atheists or the humanists would turn to to find out what the Christians believe and who is right? Right. Well, it's not a unique problem with us. I mean, as we already saw from one of the questioners, humanists don't agree on what their foundation of values always is as well. And there's a disagreement in all areas of the world. Christians disagree. Jews disagree with each other. Muslims disagree. Atheists disagree with each other. Everybody disagrees with each other. So it's not a unique problem to us. I think that a person who is convinced that Christianity in general is true can then look at the Bible, can look at Christian history, can look at these sorts of things, and the evidence will lead them to a conclusion of what the correct interpretation is. So I think the evidence is clear. Next question. I apologize. I think I'm going to pile on here a little more. Going to what you just said about turning to the Bible, I hear echoes of a couple of chapters in Genesis, and you're touting a personal God, and the word person in that is kind of loaded to me. 
I hear, in God's image. If we're inherently evil and we're created in God's image, then there's something inherently evil in God, would be something I would say here. Going with your argument there, you keep using the term rebellion against God. My second question is, who created these values and desires in God? And if they're uncreated in God, why can't they simply be uncreated in us? All right, good question. I'll answer the first one very briefly because it's not directly on topic. The answer is that, okay, I forgot the first question. I'm sorry. If we are. If we, okay, yeah, if we're made in the image of God, then isn't God evil? No, because I believe we're created good and fell into sin and that evil does not reflect God's nature. I go into more detail on it, but come to Tuesday night. That's what we're talking about on Tuesday, God and evil. But the second question, which was, remind me again, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble with this. Okay, who created the desires and values of God? And if not, then why do we need God to explain them? Well, nobody created them because I believe God is the ground of all being. He is the foundation, beginning, and source of reality. And so his values and his character are part of who he is, intrinsically, unchangeably. So they're absolute. Why couldn't we then just have the universe be absolute and the values in the universe? Yeah, because I think the thing is that God, the existence of God solves a problem that isn't solved by the existence of humanity in itself. I can have values, I can have desires, but that doesn't obligate you. I like pizza, therefore you should too. I like people, so you should like people. There's nothing that obligates it just by the fact that I like something or dislike something. And same way with you, same way with any human being, no matter how many of them you add together. You know, if the whole world likes pizza, I probably won't tell people that I don't. For motivational reasons, but not because I'm objectively bad. There's something about, rationally, there's something about the nature of God as the ground of being and being a person, the conjunction of those two things, that makes it rational that he, it leads to the conclusion that he, that his values are normative, that they are normative for the universe. And so you have to, you know, if something created his values, then he wouldn't be normative because he wouldn't be the ground of all being. So I would argue that there's something about the nature of God that makes that rational and not about us. Right. We have quite a few questions standing there. So what I would like to see that we do is that perhaps you should, all of you, each of you ask your questions and you note them down. Then depending on which question you'd like to respond, then respond afterwards. Because people have heard a lot from both sides. Let's hear a bit from the audience. So you ask your questions, then you respond at the end, okay? What do you say, listening to all the questions? Yeah, just take down, then according to your order, let them speak, you know, and be brief. Can't you just write down and remember what they have said? Okay. I'm ready. Go ahead, please, yeah. Just basing things on biological systems as evidence of, like, natural selection. You mentioned allowing things to flourish. A lot of times in life, between other human populations with other organisms, like the individual mentioned with the cows, when is it that, as a humanist, you make that distinction between allowing yourself to flourish by perhaps keeping someone else from flourishing, was my question. Being these cognizant beings, where does that discord occur? How can you make those decisions in a biological system? Short response. The discord occurs insofar as all living systems have beings which both have intrinsic and instrumental value, and sometimes in food chains, beings have instrumental value for other beings in the food chain, and their instrumental value is, within the ecosystem, is trumped by, their intrinsic value is trumped by their instrumental value. So, you know, essentially, you know, we're off, I think that we're off topic, and I apologize for bringing up, you know, topics that come out of my environmental ethics course, but, you know, ethically, what we need to do is evaluate the intrinsic and instrumental values of all beings and try to act in such a way as to maximize the recognition of beings' intrinsic value while using them instrumentally in the least possible way. So sometimes in an ecological system, it's necessary to 
cause death. When I walk along the road, for example, I may step on bugs, and that's just unavoidable, but I should try to live my life in such a way to reduce the amount of harm that I do through my actions. Okay. Next question. Respectfully and briefly, within the Christianity and its system, they have the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament actually had rules regarding owning slaves. The New Testament, Jesus Christ, the supposed creator of the universe, never once condemns the institution of slavery. And also there is a mention of Paul telling slaves to obey their masters, especially if they're Christians. And so how can we ethically take such a book or such a God seriously in a modern context when we know better now? Basically, I'm not going to add to your list the slaughter of the Canaanites, a number of other things that might be brought up, seemingly unethical things in the Bible. Well, one, how can you judge the Bible to be unethical if you don't have a foundation for ethics? So you have to borrow from theism to judge against it in this case. I don't think that's – so non-theists have no basis to make that kind of objection. I don't think the Bible contains unethical things in it. I do think the Bible contains things that we don't tend to – that we have developed assumptions about, and those assumptions may or may not be valid. And we might have to – we've been going off on our own for a long time. We've come up with all kinds of various ideas, and I think that we need to question some of them in the light of what we see in the revelations of God. Just one example, the slaughter of the Canaanites. The Canaanites were evil in a biblical worldview. They may not have been evil to a non-theist, but they were evil from a biblical perspective, and they were judged by that in an ethical sort of way. I don't see anything unethical about it. I don't want to get into slavery. It takes too far in different directions. But I do not believe – I accept the premise that the Bible contains unethical things, and I don't think there's a basis to judge it from another – from the non-theist point of view. Thanks. Next question. Thanks. I'd like an answer from both people on this question, if that's possible, and I'll make it short. If God can – it's been said in the debate that God is reasonable. If God is reasonable, why should he not be able to supply humanity with the reasons for his ethics? And if that is the case, how come those reasons do not stand apart from God and therefore make God unnecessary for ethics? If that question is too – you don't need to necessarily address that question. But the other question would be is why ought we listen to God's ethics? Why is it not anything but an appeal to authority? Okay. Briefly, the first one, I think that – why did God not explain his reasons? I'm not quite sure how to answer that question exactly. I mean, God loves and hates certain things. That's sort of just foundational in the universe. It's kind of asking, like, why does God exist? And someone always – everyone – every worldview comes to something foundational that it just is. And I think that's unavoidable. The second question, which was – I'm going to do it again. Why should we obey God? Isn't that our future? Right. Okay. Why isn't it just appeal to an authority to follow God? Well, because God ultimately – I'm going to go to my main point again. You know, that God is the foundation of reality. He owns us. We exist in the context of him just like the novelist characters exist in the context of the – and are grounded by the novel – the novelist. The characters in the novel are grounded by the novelist. And that in itself explains why God's values are normative for us. So it's not appeal to authority in the sense of, well, do this, but I don't have any actual reason. The reason is who God is and who we are in the relationship between us. That provides the rational reason why it is obligatory for us to obey God. Next question. First, I just want to thank you both for being here. It's been great. My question is for Mark. You said God's viewpoint constitutes the official values and norms. His viewpoint is what is. His viewpoint is the official viewpoint. So my question is, how do you define God's viewpoint without humanity to reference it from? So therefore, if humanity is necessary for God to define values and norms, then isn't humanity the pivotal point and not God? And therefore, then, isn't humanity the real reference point for ethics? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. But, no, I don't think it leads to that. 
Um, it, God's values aren't what they are because of us. Well, well, we are what we are because of God, because of God's values. You know, George Lucas isn't, is, it doesn't come into being and, and think that what he does because, because he writes Star Wars. You know, it, it, he writes, it com- comes from him. So it's God's values of the foundation of, of ethics, and we exist in the context of that. Now, it's true, of course, that it, that it implies our existence to say that we ought to do something. That's true. So when we, once we come into being, God's values apply to us, and obviously that, that implies our existence. But God exists apart from us. We're grounded in him, ultimately. Next question. I have a two-part question. Part one is your explanation seems to be that God is necessary for ethics because ethics are God, or God is ethics, rather, which is a very circular reasoning in that it means God is necessary for ethics because God is necessary for ethics. Part one of my question is, can you explain how God is necessary to ethics in anything other than a circular method method by saying that God is ethics? And secondly, you keep saying that God just is, and he just came into being, and we don't need any explanation for God and his ethics. If God is and should be honored because he is, why shouldn't we be honored because we are, according to the hymnist view? Okay. Um, my answer to the first question basically is just that it isn't circular. It's, it, and that's kind of the answer to the second question, too. It isn't circular. It's saying there's something about the nature of God that rationally makes him uh, the, the source of ethics. There's, there's a, in my analogy again, there's a difference between George Lucas and Darth Vader. <laughs> they're, they're different beings. They have different characteristics. It gives them different kinds of, uh, uh, their views have different normative status because of that. And I think that's also true of God and us. It's not, yes, we exist, but that's not enough. But who we are means that we cannot obligate. I can't obligate you to do anything. God can because of who he is. It's not a matter of saying, well, it's just a rational, it's an arbitrary appeal to God in, instead of us. It's not arbitrary. There's a reason. There's something about God that makes him the ground of ethics. Next question. All right, Mark, are you ready for this? Sure. All right. So the vast majority of... Theists that I know are great people, and the vast majority of atheists that I know are great people. So obviously you don't need to believe in God to be a a great person, or to act like a great person. So then, isn't our definition of God just different? I mean, shouldn't we really be debating what, what is God? Because your motivation to be a good person is God's law. My motivation, natural law. Um, social consequences is what motivates me to be a great person. So, isn't it isn't the real debate what God is? Yeah. Um, real. Well, whether or not atheists are nice people are, are good is, is irrelevant to the question of whether they have a real obligation. That's, that they have a, an explanation for moral obligation in their system. I don't think they do. Um, nor do I think they all the time have sufficient motivation. So, yeah, if atheists are nice people or, or great people, I have no objection. It's just that they don't have a basis to account for obligation. If they believe in obligation, great, they're right. But they only agree with it because, of, because uh, to agree with it, they have to, they don't have a foundation. Only theism can account for why there is uh, such a thing as moral obligation. Uh, as a philosophy student, I actually have several thousand questions for both of you, but I'm going to skip all of them just to say that I would like to thank both of you for coming here and showing up and standing up in front of an audience knowing that a good chunk of them are going to disagree with you no matter what either of you says, and that it's really something positive ethically and morally simply that we show up and talk about these things, and I, I just wanted to thank you for that.